Thank you, senior correspondent. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, y'all, everybody ready to go? He's ready. Well, y'all, thank you for coming. <clears throat> this is really good news since we've been working on the uh, new plans for education to make education better in South Carolina. Uh, we came up with, with a plan and submitted that to, to the House and the Senate and the executive budget, and then the, uh, the House has worked on a plan and has, has made their plan, improved on ours, and now the Senate is gonna improve on, on everything that's been submitted. So we are, we're at the beginning of some really remarkable and far-reaching improvements in the system that are gonna make it uh, uh, simple, gonna make it better, stronger, with, with more accountability and understanding by the parents, which will allow more input by the parents, and, and that's, that's a good thing. We, as we were talking about it a little while ago, we were commenting on how difficult it is uh, for some folks including many of us to understand exactly where, when the money goes in, what are you going to get, did you get what you're paying for, and, and so forth. And if you uh, compare it to a vending machine, it makes it pretty easy. When you go to look at your vending machine, you see exactly what it is you want. You got potato chips and cookies and, and uh, candy bars and those, and you put in your money and you get something out and it looks just like the one that you asked for. And if, uh, if there's something wrong with it, of course, you, you, know, you know where to go. So this is a, a complete opposite of the way our education system has been running. We have a number of sources of money that go into it. There are 29 different lines in the budget. And it goes to various places. It's very difficult to understand unless you've been in the business and in, in this arena for a, a while as Dr. Zace and Dr. Nielsen have been, and that's, that's why they're here. And then it's uh, virtually impossible to see how you rank, how the money was spent, was it spent well, was it uh, the results produced. So it's, uh, it's a very difficult and almost uh, opaque, impossible to understand system by the average citizen, which leads to a lot of frustration and a lot of tension and does not help education a bit. So we, are, we have an opportunity now, particularly after so many parents have been deeply involved in the education process for the last two years and have seen things they like, have seen things they don't like. Uh, they are very eager to see that the children catch up and excel. And so that is, that is the context with which we come to these, these plans that are being formalized today. And as I say, it's good news. We're doing three things, essentially, is we're simplifying the formula, and we are raising the pay schedule, and we're providing for easy to understand, quick accountability and information on a dashboard that will be prepared by and handled by the state. Again, simplifying the formula, as I mentioned, there are 25 different lines in the budget that provide the money now. Most of it comes from five different lines, and those will be put into one line that will have the amount of funds going to the various places. Now, the second thing we're doing is raising the minimum pay schedule level. That is, raising the minimum pay schedule level. There's been some confusion about that, and some have thought that meant that every teacher will get a raise. Well, there, there are some teachers that are already being paid above the minimum pay schedule that is going to be, uh, be accepted and made into, into this proviso. Of course, uh, it's th those that fall below those levels that we are concerned with. And then we know that we have, of our 71 school districts, I think there are 26 that w are already above those levels and the other 51, if I have my numbers right, that are below that. So this will have a a major impact on pay and essentially what it does is it repays it excuse me it raises the minimum pay for a, a new teacher a first year teacher who is not already getting forty thousand dollars to forty thousand dollars if they're not already, if they're already getting that or getting more than that then then this would not require them to to get a raise 
Now, the, the school district could use the money for a raise if they wanted to. That's where the flexibility comes in. But this will move up the entire pay schedule so that starting upon enactment of this proviso, the minimum pay for a brand new teacher would be $40,000 or more if the district wanted to go higher. Uh, that, is good, that is good news and we want to do that because we want to have the best teachers in the country teaching our children. Uh, just looking back on the time I've been involved, and Dr. Zace has been involved uh, a long time since in education, both at the state level and the national level, where he was the uh, deputy, super, uh, deputy secretary of education, uh, U.S., and then for a while was acting uh, secretary. And also uh, Dr. Nielsen for, for eight years was the superintendent of education here in South Carolina. So they've been involved in this longer than I think anybody in this room. But just since I've been involved in this, we've gone from a starting pay of $30,113 up to, if this is enacted, to 40,000. And that's been in just six years, that's good news, that's progress. But we want to, this is, we're building on this. We want to go more, more, and more, get better, better, and better. But this will give us a big step forward. Uh, the districts are getting all together $227 million more than they got last year under the House plan, $227 million more. The average district is getting 5.6% more. No district will be getting less. The average will be 5.6% more. And that brings us to the final point, which is the accountability dashboard. And that will be an easy to understand, easy to operate, easy to navigate dashboard that shows where the money's going in the different, to the districts, to the schools, what the money is being spent on. And also we will have the test scores and other things that show how the school is doing. So that is information that parents need to know. It, it, it will open the door to them to understand what is happening in their school. If they see things that they like, of course, we would encourage them to say, th say so. If they see things that they would like to improve or change, we would encourage them to say so. And this will give them the basic information that they can use to make those, make those decisions. So with that, I'd ask Dr. Nielsen to come forward, please. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm older, so I have to write down. I'm not gonna read it, though. Um, I really wanna thank uh, Governor McMaster and everybody who's brought this to the forefront. I can tell you, just to show my age, this conversation started 23 years ago. And it's been a difficult one, and we wanted to be child-centered, so I wanna thank the governor for bringing it forward. I certainly wanna take the time to thank the House members who voted it over. Um, Melanie Barton, who works very hard, Mark Truesdale, who works very hard on staff to help us bring consensus to this, and um, Palmetto Promise, which is Oren Smith and Ellen Weaver, they've continued this conversation all these years, so that's why we can be here today to be able to have these kinds of things. Um, I'm sure the Senate is going to follow in good steed, and I have high expectations for them in helping us be able to do this for our districts. Um, you know, it's, I think the a common word that we use, and the governor also used is, we're focused on students. We're focused on student learning. That's why we're here, system supported, but we're not focused on the systems, we're focused on students. And um, I really would be remiss also if I didn't, if I didn't acknowledge Frank Brandwater's hard work in putting all of this kind of things together. Um, let me give you just a little bit of history though. Everybody is happy about the teacher's salaries. I mean, you think about what we've been through the last two years in order to recruit, in order to retain, and quite frankly, it isn't easy to be in the classroom these days. <laughs> Some of you I'm looking at might have been there recently, but you know, I'm telling you it's not easy. But on the roll-up and the flexibility, um, it, it's been a long time. EIA started out as four line items, and then it mushroomed, and it grew. And it was kind of like, who's on first? It was very prescriptive, it was program prescriptive. Some districts thought this is good for me because this is what I want to do with my teachers in schools. Others did not. And so 
it, it, it really was a piecemeal fractured system. It was hard to understand. It was hard for boards to understand, for parents to understand, and, and teachers. So this is gonna simplify everything by rolling it together into one simple formula that gives districts the flexibility to address local needs. Now, having said that, along with that comes the responsibility for learning, you know, because we do have a responsibility and the dashboard will be a great transparent way to be able to see that. Um, there is a saying that a journey of a thousand miles takes a first step, and that's what this is. This is a first step, and there will be subsequent conversations. There are moving parts to the formula, but those are the discussions that come forward, and we don't have to hold this up because of that, but we need that simplicity to know what we're doing. The challenge, the challenge has always been is how do we provide and promote equity as well as fairness. Those two words are huge, and that's what everybody is kind of wrestling with and trying to do. Uh, so the balance of all of these things will be in future discussions, but we can take our first step now to do the roll up, get a simple formula out there and the reporting out there. We have to start somewhere. Uh, and so um, it gives us that foundation on which to build. That's probably the best way to be able to put it so that we can be fair to every district and every student because no district needs to lose. And I think that's the wonderful part, which is the hold harmless while we're having continued conversations, everybody will be held harmless. Uh, not in learning, but in funding. Um, I, we are blessed here in South Carolina in that we have a very detailed state finance manual. Every district has to follow that manual. Every dime that they spend, whether it's local, state, or federal, goes into their report and those districts are required to have an audit every year that comes to the State Department of Education. So this will enable to follow the money to see that it's being spent efficiently, that it's being spent directed towards students, and that was a blessing. We don't have to rehash that one again. So um, I, I really commend you, Governor, for having the hard conversation. Um, we, we need to look forward, we need to focus, we need to remember, frankly, that everybody involved in this conversation, we have a common goal. We want the best for every student in every school district so that they can have the quality of life to be able to succeed. It's really rather simple, guys. It's a hard discussion, but it's a simple solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newford. Dr. Zays. I'd like to thank the governor for his hard work to push this legislation through and in particular, the South Carolina House, the Ways and Means Committee, and the Education and Public Works Committee. This bill, as written, has the potential to transform public education in South Carolina and move us from near the bottom to near the top of the rankings in the United States. It's that important. I tried to get something like this done during my tenure as state superintendent, <laughs> but was unsuccessful. I guess I lacked the wherewithal to push it across the goal line. So, so Governor, congratulations to you and your work with the General Assembly. I have visited 264 schools and 81 school districts in South Carolina. And when I showed up, it wasn't just a photo opportunity or a grip and grin but an opportunity to sit down with principals and superintendents and other education leaders to have hard conversations. And we looked at school and district performance based on student learning outcomes. And if your district and your school were doing well compared to other districts and schools with similar levels of funding and poverty, it was high fives all around. And tell me what you're doing to get these great results. And if you were doing poorly compared to your peers, I wanted to know what you, Madam Superintendent, and you, Mr. Principal, were doing to improve student learning outcomes. One of the recurring themes that I heard in all of these meetings with education leaders across the state is that funding in our state is convoluted, complex, and actually unresponsive to the needs 
of the individual students and schools and districts. They pointed out that the most pressing needs of a rural school or district may be quite different from the most pressing needs of an urban school. That what's required at a high poverty school may be very different from what's required or needed at a low poverty school. And what's required and necessary or most pressing at a school that focuses on college prep may be very different than what's required at a school focusing on career prep. But all of these different pots of money that specify how dollars must be spent limited the freedom of our professional educators to, to direct those dollars to the area of highest need. This bill provides our education leaders that flexibility and that freedom to spend the dollars in such a way as to produce the greatest increase in student learning outcomes. I know that principals and superintendents and school boards across the state look forward to the passage of this legislation and I'll be cheering with them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zayas. And you mentioned a couple of things that are on the slides that I did not mention. <clears throat> One is want you, everyone to be sure that the uh, 18 and a 0.1% increase in the employer share of the state health insurance uh, will be covered by this. The House appropriated $101.7 million for that. And also the House allocated uh, funds for the 1% increase in the employer contribution to the South Carolina retirement system that came out to 37.3 million. So this is, a, it was good work by the House. We expect some good work by the Senate. We had a lot of uh, enlightened uh, and uh, knowledgeable people involved in this and I think we're making great progress. So that's the good news, all good news today. Does anybody have a question? Yes, Governor, you spoke about money following students this time around. Where has the money gone in the past and where has it been spent the long Well, that's the problem. It's been very difficult to tell with the complex formula which requires things to go in one place or another that uh, I, both doctors uh, spoke about. This removes that. It, it lumps a lot of the funds together. They can use it as they want, but the key is the, 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 as far as the salaries go, there is a schedule and it will now start at 40,000 and all go up uh, in uh, various amounts as you go up uh, in your education and training and, and experience. Uh, but um, the key to this is, is one of these, these slides to be sure that it goes where we want it to go and that is the, the disclosure, the accountability on a, a platform that will be devised by the state into which all of this information will go, will be sorted out and presented so that the, the parents and others that are, are interested in school, in, including the various school district officials and school officials can see how their school, how their district ranks and where the money is going. And like the vending machine, you, you know, you see what you want, you put your money in, well, let's see what, you, what comes out the other end. That's gonna allow people to, to know and to celebrate, to uh, uh, seek uh, improvement. So some districts are complaining that while they're getting a little bit more money, they're not getting enough to even meet the salary step requirement, much less get that, get to a $4,000 per teacher. What do you say to those districts that say they're not getting enough? Well, they, no, no, district get, no, no district is getting less money than it got before. Uh, my understanding is all of them are getting some more, but there, there is a variation on how much money goes, how much money they get, and part of that is dependent on the, um, the, 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 the state um, calculation of the, uh, the, the amount of money that comes in locally. Some counties or some districts have a very low base, others have a high base. So that is taken into consideration in, in the formula. But this, this will make it easier. Nobody is getting less than they got before. And everyone is getting some more than they got. And I think it's about, it was several, I've got the number here, the, I think it's 227 million more going out under this formula than went out last year. We've, the, the more money that we can put into education that goes into that classroom and is able to be uh, judged by the parents as to whether it is effective or not, 
uh, the better. So this, this is a big step, as Dr. Nielsen mentioned. Uh, she was here, for, you remember, for eight years during Governor Campbell's time, starting in 1991, and they were working on these things then. It takes a long time to change a system that's been in place for so long. In fact, this one's been in place for so long, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, Johnny Cash had a song about uh, one, one piece at a time, where he went and he wanted to work at a Cadillac factory, and he wanted to... He figured they wouldn't just miss one piece at a time. So over 20 years, he pulled out different pieces and he had him a nice Cadillac. It was 1947, 48, 49, 50, 61, 62 Cadillac. But you pull on the, uh, blow the horn and the lights come on and you step on the brakes and the accelerator goes down. They just don't all fit together. And that is, that is what's happened, I, I believe, in our system. We've been putting bits and pieces in it over the years trying to make it better and it's turned out making it complicated and not responsive. But when we have this accountability dashboard, it'll be prepared by the state. <clears throat> and we've, we've had good luck with this with those that we did in Accelerate SC with keeping the people informed with what was going on. If uh, I believe that that is one of the real real keys to this because all these reports need, or must be made by the schools, but they have not been presented to the to the public and to the average citizen, as well as the, as the educators in a fashion that they're easy to understand and compare. With the proposed increases at each step along the schedule, even for those districts like you mentioned that would still be paying above that new minimum, would you recommend that they still increase salaries? That's, up, that's the flexibility. That's, that is what is involved. Would you like to speak to that? Well, I, I, I think that is the flexibility, and I think one of the things that's important that both Mick and the governor have talked about is in those line items in the EIA, they're very prescriptive about certain programs. Well, I might be in a district where I get federal money to have an after school program, but I don't really need to spend the EIA money on that, but then I can use that to do additional. I know some districts have done bonuses just to keep people teaching you know, during the pandemic and so forth. So that's what gives that flexibility to be able to actually concentrate on teachers and students. And without, without us saying, hey, here are 25 different programs you must do, and maybe it doesn't fit their need. And so that flexibility will allow them to use that money for that. And then districts have local money too. And so that's what kind of, that, that's why you need a simple way of looking at all this so everybody knows where is the money going? What are you spending? Uh, why are we not duplicating? You know, and with, with these programs always comes paperwork. You know, also, so just think about all the paperwork we can reduce by having that put into a simple formula. Uh, I was going to say that teachers are the single most critical component in education. If there is a silver bullet, it's teacher quality. Not qualifications, quality. Teachers are to education what doctors are to medicine. The providers of the service for which the institution exists. And you know that doctors are paid a lot more than hospital administrators. It's important that we pay our teachers a fair salary that will attract the best and the brightest of our high school graduates into the teaching profession. Okay. Yes, sir. All of all of the above. I mean, th this is as both doctors have described, this has been a process that's gone on for, for a long time. A lot of people have been interested in assimilating information and ideas, and uh, a, a lot of that has, has come together at this, at this time. I think, again, the pandemic, two years worth of pandemic, has focused attention on education and, and shown some, some weak spots as well as some strong spots, and so that's what we're attempting to do now is to minimize the former, increase the latter. Some Any more? Well, we, we, as 
No, Dr. Zay said we, we need to have the very best, and in order to do that, we would need to pay them. But just in recent years, we've gone up, I think, $3,000. We were, we were uh, in 20, 2021, we were ready to go up into the top 25. I think we were raising about $3,000 that, that year, and then the virus came along, and so we just had to have a continuing resolution. But uh, to answer your question, we, we, want, we want to be able to pay more, and we want to pay more. We want to have the best teachers we can get. We want to teach them, teach them because uh, we've got a great opportunity with, with the people of South Carolina. These businesses around the world tell us how great our people are. They're great people, and people that don't live here tell us that. They can see it quicker than we can, but the, the, the key to that is we have to get them educated and trained for these jobs of the future. And to do that, you have to have the very best teachers, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Well, and Dr. Anthony, you talked about first steps. Obviously, with pretty much the new ESA intact from 1977, what would you like to see as next steps to get this well, really uncomplicated? <laughs> uncomplicated. It will never be uncomplicated. Uh, but I, I think what we have to do is implement this. You always learn from implementation. And I think that's the wisest thing to do. It gives us a chance to get it in, to continue to get additional feedback, like on the question you asked. For example, if, if I go to school and I get a master's degree, I do get a higher step because I have a higher degree, not just entering, but in the system. So there may be some tweaks that have to happen uh, with that uh, in the future. And, and you know, not all counties uh, assess things at the same way. And so that might be a fur further kind of conversation we have to have. But our job is to make sure that every school district and every student and every teacher has the, what they need to be able to succeed. And I think that's what this is really trying to do. Um, you know, I, I know some school districts did put local money in for bonuses. Uh, some school districts couldn't do that. Uh, but hopefully we won't have any more pandemics and uh, with that would not be necessary to have to be done to come. Last question, if there is one. This could go for anybody. Uh, is there anybody with so many people running for state superintendent of education that you endorse, or is there anything in particular you're looking for in a future state superintendent? We're looking for a great educator and want in it to all those who want to get into the arena to come on in. I, I think uh, Dr. Nelson and I have already endorsed somebody. If you look at our web, uh, the websites, you'll figure out who that is. <laughs> Yeah, so if you can address the timing of this and why perhaps we don't have any legislators out here today. It's Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, a lot is, of people aren't here. Is it because of here. the budget hearing coming up, or why are you doing this now? Because this is, uh, there have been a lot of questions raised. There's a lot of con uh, um, questions being raised because th this is a, a big, big step, and as a result, a lot of interest has been created. And so now is the time to answer some of those questions and, um, and, and point uh, the direction in which we want to go. People are paying attention. Thank you, everyone.